I had always dreamed of living and working outside the US. And in 2009, I felt like my dream had come alive. I'd been living and working in Paris for a few years, and I loved everything about it. The food, the life on the streets, the energy, the language, and particularly the culture. I worked hard during the week, but on the weekends, people didn't work. They used it as a time to recharge. If you put your mobile phone on a cafe table, people would kind of look at you like something was wrong, let alone if you took out a computer and started doing email. So you can imagine my surprise when on a Saturday night in Paris, I got a phone call and it was a work number. I answered, and to my even greater surprise, someone from my company had called and offered me the opportunity to move to Brazil. Now, to put it in perspective, I had never been to Brazil. I didn't speak any Portuguese. I didn't know anyone from Brazil other than the person who had called me. And I knew even more so that a lot of the people in our office didn't speak much English. And beyond our office, most people in the country didn't speak much English yet. But again, my dream was to live and to work outside the US. And so I jumped into this opportunity. And in 2009, I moved to Sao Paulo. Now, this was just before the Olympics were announced, and the economy was booming. Everybody was really excited that things in Brazil were changing, and changing for the better. But I realized that one of the reasons why I was invited to go to that and take the opportunity in Brazil was that the team there needed some fresh perspectives. I remember my first day on the job, though. I was in a big meeting. It was an all-day review of all the elements of our business. And traditionally, the meeting was done in Portuguese. Of course, I was the new boss, and people wanted to try and accommodate and, and be inclusive, and so they tried to speak some English. But it was hard. They did, and they kind of struggled through the meeting. At one point, I remember even thinking, oh, I'm going to sneak out and go to the restroom. And as soon as I stood up, everyone noticed I was leaving, and they switched back to Portuguese. I realized that wasn't going to work. I knew that language was going to be a big issue for my time in Brazil. After a few months, or actually even, even after the first few weeks, I started to realize that things were getting better in the office, but I was nervous about going outside the office. I was nervous about going out and visiting customers. Yet, that nervousness didn't, didn't last long. Suddenly, a CEO of a large retail company located in a really rural part of Brazil had heard that I had moved to Brazil, and he really wanted to meet. Of course, I couldn't refuse. I asked my team if he spoke English, and they kind of sort of laughed at me in the kind of fun way that Brazilians do to say, no, that, that's definitely not going to happen. So I took the challenge. I went to this really rural town, and there wasn't much there, but there was a very lively main street. And there was this big retail shop that sold electronics and computers. And that's the place where I was going. I walked to the back of the shop through all the different things that they were selling, and there was a little tiny conference room that was incredibly hot with no air conditioning. I was in a full suit and tie. There was a plate of kind of fresh Brazilian fruits on the table, but it was really hot. Then the door swung open, and this large gentleman with a big gray beard came, and he was wearing a short sleeve shirt, and he just gave me this big hug and had this huge smile on. And you could tell that he was really glad I was there. So we sat down, and we started the meeting, and he began explaining, mostly in Portuguese, but what his business challenge was, and how he was hoping that technology could maybe help him in some new ways. He was talking in Portuguese, but he was so expressive. And of course, I had brought someone with me from my team who I was hoping could help translate. She had promised, but quickly she realized he was speaking so fast that it would be very hard to keep up. So I just sat there and listened. I listened intently. I focused on what this person was saying. I focused on their facial expressions. I focused on their body language and how he was moving. And I couldn't quite understand all the content, but what I could tell was that he was very frustrated. So in fact, that's the first thing I said, and my colleague kindly translated. I said, literally, I can feel that you're frustrated. And immediately, his face lit up again. He was so happy. He started using a few more English words, and he started expressing in more and more ways the challenges that he was facing. At the end of the conversation, what I learned was that he felt that someone had listened to him. Even though I didn't speak the language, I was so focused on trying to understand what he was saying that he felt I had listened. He said most people that come to meet with him are there talking a lot, and they're trying to sell things, but that they're not there to listen. And as a result of my listening, he felt respected, he felt that we could build trust together, and he felt that we could have a professional relationship. And that was a successful meeting. So I ran back to the office, and I was so excited, and I told my team what had happened, and I said, let's go do more of these. Let's go have more conversations with different kinds of customers and see what else we can learn. In fact, one of our, our, our founder of my company has a very famous quote on this concept of listening, and that sometimes employees who are the most or customers who are the most unhappy can be some of your greatest source of learning. 
And that definitely proved true in this case, not only in that one meeting, but in several meetings like it. We learned so much that we changed our entire strategy for how we were going to market in Brazil. New campaigns, new advertising, new creatives, fun social events. And it changed the perception of what my product line was and our brand was in the market. In fact, it was such a success that we took Brazil from the sixth to the third largest market in the world for PCs in two years. We went through hyper growth. People started wanting a car first as they got some income in Brazil, and second, they wanted a PC. We were able to ride that momentum and really help build and grow a business. And I was this hero, but all I really did was listen and sit down and listen to our customers and what it was they had to say. In 2012, I moved to Hong Kong. I had always been fascinated by Hong Kong. I love big cities. And one of the most exciting things about Hong Kong is this mix of East and West. Because in some cases, people are speaking English, and it's very clean, the streets, and proper kind of British structured society. And the other side, sometimes the other side of town, or even the other side of the street, it's people are speaking Chinese, and they're running around, and it's a lot more hectic and chaotic, and a huge sense of energy. I loved that mix of East and West, but I was there for work. And again, on my first day on the job, it wasn't an easy one. I remember an email that came in early that morning that said, country performance in Asia. And Hong Kong was ranked 14 out of 14 of all the countries where we have significant presence in Asia. It was the worst performing business unit in the world. So I had to begin somewhere. And I started with a listening tour. And I went out and I scheduled, filled up my Outlook calendar with probably close to 100 meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings with team members and with colleagues, to sit down and to ask them their opinion on what could be different. This was incredibly unusual, and everybody was talking about the new boss for a few reasons. One, I was breaking hierarchy. I was sometimes going to different people in the organization without even speaking to their manager first. Second, when I sat down, I wasn't telling them my opinion on what we should be doing, but I was asking about them. I was asking about their careers and what they had learned and their observations. And what I learned was that there were so many great ideas, but often there were people who weren't in the right role, or they weren't set up to contribute in the right way. Or perhaps sometimes the hierarchy limited people hearing their voices. But when I sat down to listen, I learned enough great ideas to build a plan for how to go fix the business. What I didn't fully appreciate at that time also was that just by listening, I was earning the respect and eventually the trust of the people that I would work with to help make the plan successful. I use this image because during the time that I was in Hong Kong, there were also a large protest movement of the students who were challenging the government because they felt that the government wasn't listening to them. And they put these post-its on a part of the city with their opinions and beliefs to try and encourage the government to listen to them. Very well connected. Later, I moved to Beijing. Now, Beijing and mainland China, as we call it in Hong Kong, had always seemed like the ultimate adventure. And in Beijing, I loved the culture and so much that was happening, the traditional nature of what was going on there. But I was assigned a very big task. I was assigned to create a separate new division for my company in a world that was very different from what we had been doing and selling otherwise so far in China. And I got to build my own team of sales and marketing and product management and customer support and engineering and all the different functions and treat it kind of like an incubated business unit to see if that we could do things differently. It was hard. But my second challenge was a little bit even more challenging and in some ways more fun, and it was to be a sponsor for our millennial workforce. We were hiring and retaining so many great um, fresh talents coming from university and MBA programs, but the question was how could we make that experience better? How could we help encourage them to stay even longer and to make sure that they had the skills to be really successful and contribute to the company? I took both jobs very seriously, and both of them helped really inform my experience in, in China. I still remember my first meeting on that first day, and it was to a large manufacturing customer. Now, in China, you can imagine there are a lot of manufacturing companies. This one was located in a pretty big city, and they had a very big plant. And I sat down with the CEO of this company, and she was so excited to meet, and so excited to meet someone who maybe had some perspectives different than the people she met with in China. And she told me about the situation she was facing. She said, you know, business has been good in China. We have a lot of demand for our manufactured products. But increasingly, there's more and more competition. And as a result of the competition, our customers aren't coming back to us. They're going to our competition and buying from them. And what worried her more was that she was losing the feedback from her customers about what it would take to make products that were good for the long term and how to evolve her product portfolio. 
what I realized was that she needed customer loyalty. She needed to find a way to create engagement with her customers so that they would come back. The second big situation she talked about was in her employees. She said she had a great workforce, but that she would train and invest in them, and then they would often go and work for someone else, sometimes just even for a little bit more money. And she said all her great investment and training would sometimes just walk out the door. And as I reflected on that, I reflected on the same importance of loyalty, and that loyalty was what she needed to create with her customers as well as with her employees. It was very clear that there was a connection between the two, but if that's what she needed, what I didn't yet know was how to help her make it happen. Listening was what I reflected on as a possible solution. And as I started talking and thinking about my own experience, writing notes about those meetings, and I reflected on my experience in Brazil and in, in Hong Kong and other places, I realized that Brazil helped teach me how to listen to customers. Hong Kong helped teach me how to listen to employees. And in China, I was starting to find that I was teaching other businesses and other business leaders how to do both. That there's a strong connection because when you deeply listen to someone, you hopefully earn their respect and they feel that you understand them. And when you earn their respect, you can earn trust. And trust is the foundation of a relationship. And that's how you can build an ongoing relationship with anyone that you're working with or that you're spending time with. China, it worked. It worked for us in a big way. We found a way to connect between customers and employees. As I reflected so much of the conversations I was having, I was writing and started writing some articles and notes, and eventually I wrote a whole book about what was happening in China and the connection between employees and customers. When I looked around the world at examples where there was good engagement for companies of one or the other, I found that they were often linked that there was strong engagement with employees, that when, custom, when companies created a culture where they listened to employees, those employees are motivated to go out and listen to customers. Because if a customer has a good idea or feedback or a suggestion, then you're eager to go run and tell your manager about what you heard from the customer. But if you don't feel like there's that culture of listening in your company, like your managers aren't going to listen to the feedback that you're hearing from customers, they don't work. So there's this very strong connection between creating a culture of listening, both for employees and for customers. And it worked in China. In our first year alone, we became the fastest growing division for my company and continued from there. We were hiring great people. They wanted to stay on the team. And our customers in the market saw what we were doing, saw how we were using technology, and they wanted to learn from us. Sometimes people ask me the difference between hearing and listening. And to me, it's very clear. Hearing is something that we do so often in our lives. We might listen to headphones and we're hearing music, we're hearing sounds around us. We might overhear voices on a train or on the streets, but it's a passive exercise. Listening is something that's active. It requires focus, it requires attention. And so I encourage all of you, whether you're speaking to a, a team member or a colleague, a coach, a manager, a friend, a family member, a teacher, it's an opportunity to step back and to close your laptop, to put your phone away, and to look at the person you're speaking to and to intently and actively listen. I believe that there's an incredible opportunity in the world for better listeners. That in a world where people are better listeners, we can have deeper understanding. Even when people disagree, a world where people understand different perspectives is a world I want to live in. And I hope you'll agree it can lead to a better world. Thank you.